Hey guys, since you loved my last video and in my mind, I thought I could do a better job. I've decided to not make a part two that covers a multitude of his videos. I've decided to in instead make a video that hones in on only one of his videos. And that is the debunking out of Africa theory in under 15 minutes. And to be upfront with you, unlike a lot of his other videos, this contains in my eyes, no plagiarism. However, as I've noticed, whenever he starts to deviate from the source material, he usually gets a lot of information wrong. So looking at his aptly titled video, we can actually cut this down to under 10 minutes. As if we cut out the introduction and the epilogue, as they total to be almost 6 minutes long, we can really drop down his video to 7 minutes and 57 seconds. I only mention this because this almost 8 minutes of his video is the only thing I'm going to be covering. And for greater ease, I divided his video further into three sections based on the topics he goes over. Anyways, let's jump into the first section. This is the largest section of the video, with it starting at 239 to 603. A good chunk of the video is about Robert here discussing Artie, Lucy, and Owen Lovejoy's thoughts. Around the three minute mark is when Robert here starts getting a massive amount of information wrong though. He's most well known for his work on reconstructing Lucy, an alleged human ancestor with an opposable big toe on its feet, meaning they resembled thumbs for grasping branches and climbing trees. Now, it wouldn't be unusual for a viewer to assume that these are Lucy's feet because Robert is talking about Lucy's feet. Those are not Lucy's. Those are Artie's. Artie's feet had a more hand shape to them. But for Lucy, they were... Well, Lucy's feet were very modern in comparison. Robert also brings up that Lucy had a big toe that was imposable. This isn't true either. While they had originally described the Australopithecus's foot to have a deviated toe based on the fossil little foot, to note though, this deviation was not to the extent of Artie's. And later on, there were additional fossil findings that ultimately removed this deviation altogether. So note, Lucy does not have a foot that looked like Artie's, or that of a hand, or that it had an opposable toe. Robert's statements right after are probably one of the most troubling statements to be made. A Lovejoy claimed that Lucy, which was dated to 3.4 million years ago, was at least partially bipedal. He proposes that Artie, another alleged human ancestor dated to between 4 and 5 million years ago, spent more of its time allegedly walking than Lucy, despite being over a million years older. Why is this the most troubling? That's because these statements by Owen Lovejoy don't exist. So for a lot of Robert's incorrect information, I usually can attribute them to being either ignorance or cognitive bias. But for this, he is completely making it up. How do I know he's making it up? Well, as I said before, you can't find this statement made by Owen. And of course, Robert hasn't given us any citation for this claim. And I know, I know, an easy counter to me is just, well, because you can't find it doesn't mean it isn't out there. And yeah, that's, that is correct. But what we can do next is look up statements made by Owen Lovejoy to see if his thoughts on the matter are equal to what Robert claims them to be. A good place to look would probably be Science Volume 326 on page 71, titled, The Pelvis and Femur of Artipithecus Ramidus, The Emergence of Upright Walking by Owen Lovejoy. On page 71, three paragraphs give indication on what Owen believes in. Although the foot of anatomy of Artie shows that it was still climbing trees, on the ground, it walked upright. Its pelvis is a mosaic that, although far from being chimpanzee-like, is still much more primitive than that of Lucy. Changes made in the upper pelvis rendered Artie an effective upright walker. It could also run, but probably with less speed and efficiency than humans. Running would have also exposed it to injury because it lacked advanced mechanisms such as those that would allow it to decelerate its limbs or modulate collision forces at its heel. Australopithecus, which had given up its grasping foot and abandoned active climbing, had evolved a lower pelvis that allowed it to run and walk for considerable distances. 
In the second from Ardipithecus to Australopithecus, modifications produced a pelvis and lower limb that facilitated more effective upright walking and running, but were no longer useful for climbing. All of these paragraphs indicate that Owen here believed that Lucy walked more than and did so in a more effective manner than that of Artie. So Robert's claims about Owen's proposition that Artie walked more than Lucy is completely false and is a lie. But let's say you still don't believe me and I'm just cherry picking my information. My response would be, there is a better source than an article from 2009. My most recent source would be from the month of April in 2022. Dear Lovejoy, I wanted to factory check on information related to the Ardipithecus, more specifically, a YouTuber named Robert Zephyr, who commonly refers to himself as an anthropologist, made the claim on a video with more than 100,000 views that you said something akin to that Artie had walked more than Lucy. I have looked around for the source of where Robert may have gotten this, however, with no luck. So I thought the best source to go to next is the man himself. Have you made a statement akin to this? And then you can see at the bottom, I actually linked the video. Hi, Eric. Thanks for your interest in our work. Sephir seems very confused, especially since he mixes Artie and Lucy. Artie is 4.4 million years ago and did have a fully opposable great toe. Lucy, on the other hand, poor choice of words perhaps, has a highly evolved virtually modern foot with a completely adducted great toe, non-opposable, a longitudinal arch, and even detailed modifications that make their foot essentially modern. No, I never at any point said that Arnie walked more than Lucy. In fact, it would be the other way around. Lucy had completely lost the grasping foot that Artie had, so climbing with a very rigid propulsive lever as a foot instead of a foot that was moderately hand-like would have been difficult. My comments about who evolved from whom are taken out of context in the sense that, as you know, neither an ape nor a human could evolve from the other. Both are descendants from a common ancestor, at least 5 million years of age. My statement simply points out that anatomically, much of human anatomy has remained more primitive and less evolved than that of apes, especially the foot. Only modern apes have a hand-like foot. All other primates have amniocent great toes, but are nevertheless not as hand-like as the foot of a chimpanzee and gorilla, but especially the former. Robert is lying, as it's made clear by the man himself, Owen Lovejoy, that he's never made that statement that already walked more than Lucy because he clearly believes in the opposite. While Robert does lie about what the anthropologist Owen Lovejoy said, he also gives us his own take on Lucy and Artie, arguing that he believes that both were tree dwellers and did not walk upright. My own analysis is that neither Lucy or Artie, which were a little over three feet tall, walked upright at all and were both primarily tree dwellers not only because their feet resembled hands like other apes, but because their furry ape-like bodies did not sweat the way all bipedal hominins do, as sweating is a trait that is associated with running and hunting, which neither of these specimens did. So as we know before, firstly, Lucy did not have a hand-like foot, and to determine whether someone walks upright based on if they had fur, as to determine later whether they sweated or not, is the dumbest thing I've heard of. It really shows that Robert has no idea what he's talking about. First of all, almost all animals sweat. Second of all, why latch onto fur? That doesn't indicate whether something is tree dwelling or if it walks upright at all. Right after his monkeys don't sweat take, Robert transitions and concludes this section by bringing up how science got it wrong with the Nebraska man and the Piltdown man. The artistic reconstructions in museums are deceptive, showing erect, upright models with human-like feet, which is a fraud. And while they're not completely fake specimen like the Piltdown man, which was a baboon's jaw glued onto a human skull and touted as the missing link by the British Museum for almost 50 years, or the Nebraska Man, which was another imaginary creation based on what turned out to be a pig's tooth. And again, all of these statements are once again examples that Robert really has no understanding of anthropology. 
It would be more accurate to say that his type of work is easily more reminiscent of the Piltdown Man and the Nebraska Man than to that of modern science. Anyways, let's move on to the next section. This section, for any and all intentions, is basically about ghost DNA that was found in African populations. Which anthropologists have labeled a ghost species, meaning it's considered super archaic, not yet identified in the fossil record, but likely Homo erectus or Homo habilis, over 1 million years removed from modern hominins, and comprises up to 19% of Sub-Saharan African DNA not found in the DNA of Asians or Caucasians. Now, I know that I have covered this information in my latest video about Robert, but it shouldn't hurt to go over it again and throw in some new information with it. The initial bit, super archaic, stood out to me, as unlike the last time we covered Robert, he never used the term super before, and instead just said archaic. While the term super could have been easily just used as a flourish or an exaggeration by Robert, Digging a little deeper actually gives us a better explanation on his later misunderstandings about this ghost population. As said before in my latest video about Robert, the term Homo erectus is never mentioned in any publication about the paper or the paper itself. What probably has happened is that Robert confused the publications about the paper on Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestors in a bread with a distantly related hominid and the publications on the paper Ghost Archaic Integrations in African Populations. As there are multiple publications that make the claim that a ghost population that may be the Homo erectus had mated with Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestors. And for the latter, no article or paper makes the claim that Ghost Archaic Integration in African Populations was to be from Homo erectus. So what probably happened is that Robert read ghost population and assumed they were talking about the same ghost population. This is even made more likely as both papers came out in the same month and in the same year. Finally, on to the bit that this DNA is only found in Africans. And once again, this information is completely made up and there is no citation or source to show it otherwise. In fact, there is evidence to show the contrary. As they conclude in their supplementary material from the paper, these results suggest that a component of the archaic ancestry that we detect in African populations is shared with non-African populations. So yes, that archaic DNA, that ghost population, it does exist within non-African populations. Robert says all of this to make this conclusion. In other words, it's not possible for Sub-Saharan Africans that contain this archaic DNA that is absent in Cro-Magnon to have left Africa 35,000 years ago and magically mutated into what became modern day Europeans or Caucasians or Asians. Firstly, that isn't when the first early humans left. It's more so placed to be at 60,000 years ago instead of 35,000 years ago. Secondly, as is made clear by the entirety of this video and that conclusion just there, that Robert here doesn't even believe in evolution, as he suggests that this transition is to be that of magic. Speaking of magic... The last section is the slimmest of sections. Not because Robert doesn't cover a lot of subjects, quite the opposite in fact, but that each subject he covers, he only touches barely, making it seem like he's doing a speed run to get to the topic of Atlantis. For example, he starts with the Canary Islands, only then to bring up the Basque and RH negative blood, for him lastly to transition all of this to the page of Center for Basque Studies, where they claim that no one knows where the Basque came from, but that they might be from Atlantis. However, even the mention of Atlantis itself is done only for a moment before jumping to the next topic. The concept of Atlantis becomes less fanciful and more probable when one looks at Pleistocene or Ice Age maps of the Atlantic Ocean. When Atlantis was said to have existed and sea levels were much lower or genetic maps of the Pleistocene distribution of DNA on both sides of the Atlantic, such as haplogroup X. This on screen is a fairly easy call out to begin with. The Ice Age sea levels were 300 to 400 feet lower, but to get to the heights shown on screen, you would have to drop it to about 8,000 feet. Which is a bit funny as he encourages his viewers to look at a map, 
But if you did look at a map from the Ice Age, you still wouldn't see any of this because you have to drop it to 8,000 feet. And then we listen to him jump to the topic of Haploop Group X and then immediately jump off of it, which entirely fits into his style of assertion of facts. Rather than coming up with a concrete set of information that fits together easily, we have a multitude of different concepts that only connect to each other by singular thin threads. For example, under Robert's logic, RH negative blood is connected to Atlantis, and Atlantis is connected to Haplogroup X. However, Robert doesn't ever present a connection between RH negative blood and Haplogroup X. That's because there isn't any. Some Native American populations do contain Haplogroup X, but Native American populations themselves are known famously to have the lowest amount of RH negative blood than any other continent. Or the fact that while it is true that Basque do have high amounts of RH negative blood, the map Robert finally enough shows haplogroup X to be the highest in Southern Eastern Europeans and not the Basques. So Robert's evidence doesn't really support itself as we see there really isn't a connection between haplogroup X and RH negative blood. The one thing I don't get is why Atlantis? I understand that Atlantis has a cool topic, but I don't get picking Atlantis for being the origin of mankind. The city of Atlantis was a ticking time bomb. As soon as they ran out of divine blood, their society collapsed. On the other hand, there is another society who was also destroyed by a great disaster from the same story of Atlantis. Here are some passages from Critias, which was naturally adapted for wisdom and virtue. And there they implanted brave children of the soil and put into their minds the order of government. They were renowned all over Europe and Asia for their beauty of their persons and for their many virtues of their souls. And of all men who lived in those days, they were the most illustrious. So you have a society that was also raised by the gods, except they were raised to be wise and focused on government. And that they were virtuous as they were respected. And they lack that important caveat and necessity for divine blood. So what is this magical city that existed during the times of Atlantis? Well, it's the great mythical city of Athens. This may sound strange because how can Athens be this mythical city? I thought they were destroyed. It's true. Ancient Athens was destroyed by a great flood. And all of those who survived dwelt on tall mountains that later rebuilt the city of Athens. This is used as a, an explanation of why no one from Athens or Greece, for that matter, remember the War of Atlantis, as anyone who dwelt in the cities were destroyed by a great flood. This is all to say that you could, based on Robert's style of evidence, just as easily come to the conclusion that all of humanity came from ancient Athens or any other made-up society. As said before, this section is incredibly thin, as if when asked to show evidence for what Robert really believes in, we end up finding out that Robert really doesn't have any strong evidence, which really isn't as surprising as like the rest of his video, Robert has a tenuous grasp on any of the subjects he talks about, and it's questionable on why he refers to himself as an anthropologist. I think that wraps up everything for Robert's video. Luckily enough, I have more time to work on stuff like this, so expect more videos soon. And like always, peeps, thanks for watching.